God help us. They're still out there. Those were the last words in my grandfather's diary, which was found open on the table at which he shot himself in 2019. I was the one who found his body, a hole blasted through his head with his old army pistol. I can still see the scene to this day, blood dripping down the sides of the desk, the metallic scent on the air. I don't think it'll ever leave me, but that's not why I'm writing this. After I had grieved, that sentence began filling me with a morbid curiosity. They're still out there. Who, what, was out there? My grandfather had always been a quiet man who kept to himself and spoke little about his past. He had served in the army of the USSR in his youth, and I always assumed he kept silent about it out of guilt and being part of one of the cruelest regimes in the history of the world. After translating and reading his diary, I know better. That's what I'm here to tell you about. I know what he was keeping quiet about and why he took his life in 2019. It's all in the diary he kept during his time in the army. The first few months he writes about are mundane, mostly detailing his training and first deployment. What is clear from these parts is that he was a patriotic man who had no trouble following orders, a soldier who kept his mouth shut and his head down. That's probably what got him where he ended up. Six months after his training, he was transferred to a base in the Ural Mountains he had never heard of. And that's where things start to get strange. This is his story. September 2nd, 1958. This place is like no base I have ever been stationed at. It's cut into the side of the mountains themselves, almost wholly concealed and practically undetectable from the outside. We are not allowed any communication with the rest of the world. The base is built in five descending levels, going down to the roots of the mountain. Each level is accessed by a single tunnel, with airlocks and security stations connecting them. Without authorization, you cannot leave the level you are currently in. Our commander is a hard man named Sergei Yahontov. He talks little and is ruthless in disciplining his soldiers. I have only seen him once, on my arrival here. He gave us our standing orders, which must be obeyed at all times. These orders are what give me pause about this whole situation. They seem ludicrous, but several men have already been punished for not keeping them in mind. If any staff member acts disoriented or follows you to a secluded part of the base, sound the alarm immediately. You are authorized to use lethal force if they do not desist. If you find yourself in a place you do not remember entering, sound the alarm immediately and lie face down on the floor with your hands on your head. But the strangest order is the last. If you are stationed at level 5 and the screaming stops, sound the alarm immediately. You are authorized to use lethal force until relieved. I don't know what to think of this. I wish to serve my country, but these orders fill me with a strange dread I've never felt before. September 5th, 1958. Today I befriended another soldier stationed here. His name is Yuri Ivanovich, a private like me. He seems talkative and friendly, an unusual trait among the soldiers stationed here, and he was eager to talk once I told him I was new at the base. We were discussing the strangeness of the place and the secrecy surrounding it when I summoned the courage to ask him about what our purpose here was. Yuri, I began carefully. Do you know anything about what this place is supposed to be? What is level 5? And what is that screaming the orders mention? Yuri's smile faded. He leaned in closer to me. It's best you don't ask about level 5 Michael, he said under his breath. Nothing good ever comes of talking about that place. Keep your head down and you might be lucky enough never to go down there. My skin crawled. Yuri was usually a quite amiable man, but now he was deadly serious. What's level 5 though? Have you ever been sent down there? I haven't, no, he answered. Thank God, but I know someone who has. What happened to him? I asked, realizing I too was instinctively whispering. He came back, but he was never the same. Yuri answered sadly. He's been changed ever since. Even the fact he came back is not common. Many soldiers sent to level 5 never return. Did he ever tell you about what he saw there? Only one thing, five years, he told me. They've been screaming in the caves for five years. Yuri would tell me no more and left me at my post with more questions than answers. September 11th, 1958. 
Yesterday we were sent on patrol in the area surrounding the base. The surrounding mountains are an icy wasteland, and I was freezing within minutes of setting foot outside. Yuri was in our unit. He had regained his usual happy demeanor since our conversation, and seemed almost untroubled by the biting cold. Our orders were simple. If we met anyone, we were to make sure they came nowhere near the mountain. We were to remain hidden if possible, but if we found any hikers going in the direction of our base, we were authorized to use any necessary measures to dissuade them. I hoped it wouldn't come to that. We only came across a single group of travelers and thankfully, they were going in a direction which would take them away from our base. We departed shortly after making sure they weren't a threat. Whatever it is we are guarding here, it is so dangerous that even the lives of Soviet citizens are a worthy price to pay for keeping it secret. September 14, 1958. Today, Yuri introduced me to the soldier who had been to level 5. It was a complete accident that all three of us were stationed at the same guard post. Yuri, always talkative, took no time in starting a conversation to make the hours go by faster. The soldier's name is Ivan. He is a thin man, with nervous eyes that flick from side to side constantly. He talks in an anxious whisper. Yuri wasn't lying. Whatever Ivan saw at level 5, it has left him changed forever. Yuri wouldn't let me talk with him about his time there, but I didn't even want to once I saw the man's state of mind. It would be cruel to remind him of something so obviously traumatizing. But even so, I left the meeting more anxious about this place than before. Ivan wouldn't stop whispering to himself. It was quiet, under his breath, but I made one sentence out clearly enough. Five years, five years, five years, it's been inside them, in the dark, for five years. The next few months go by with not much interesting happening. My grandfather spends most of his time either out on patrol in the surrounding areas or on guard duty in various parts of the base. He is never sent down to level 5 and doesn't inquire more about it. The next interesting entry is in mid-December, December 15th, 1958. I will never forget this day. We were on guard duty, checking the staff going from level 4 to level 3. It had been a long shift, 5 hours so far, with 3 more to go. It was nearing midnight when things started going to shit. It was a quiet moment and the corridor was empty, except for me and Yuri when the man appeared. He was a researcher, not a soldier, balding with a pair of spectacles and a round red face. He was strangely hunched over, dragging his feet and looking at the floor. I figured he was simply tired after a long shift. Papers please, comrade. I asked him as he came up to my post. He looked up at me and I started back. His eyes were red and bloodshot, darting from side to side. Just like Ivan's, he mumbled something under his breath and made to walk past me. I stepped into his path. He hadn't given me any identification and I couldn't let him pass me by. Comrade, I need to see your authorization before you can leave level 4. The man was looking at the ground again. Now he was closer to me, I could see him shivering. He was mumbling something under his breath. I leaned closer in to hear him. They can't get out, they... They can't get out. We've left them there for five years. Five years. I backed away slightly, raising my firearm. Yuri could see something was wrong and aimed his gun at the man's head. Comrade, he said loud and slow. Please give us your authorization. The man looked at him wide-eyed. Have you been to level five, soldier? He asked in a hoarse whisper. Have you? Have you heard the trapped men scream? I need you to lie down right now, I said, panic rising in me. No amount of military training could prepare me for one of our own to behave like this. Yuri circled around, moving behind the man. The researcher didn't seem to notice, his attention totally fixed on me. He stumbled forwards and I aimed my gun in nerveless fingers. They can never get out, he said, his voice trembling. If any men are trapped in level 5, we will get them out. I said, trying to sound soothing and calm even as my heart hammered in my chest. The... The men... The researcher mumbled. Then he laughed. No, no. The men are trapped, but it's not them that can never be freed. 
They're not alone in the caves. He looked me dead in the eyes. It's the things in them that can never escape. He lunged forward, making to run past me. A gunshot rang out through the corridor. The researcher crumbled to the floor, blood leaking from his chest. Commander Sergei Yahontov stood behind Yuri, a smoking pistol in his hand. His face was twisted and barely contained fury. I snapped to attention, Yuri quickly following suit. What is your first standing order, Private? He asked, walking face to face with us and looking at me. To sound the alarm if any staff member appears disoriented or follows us, sir. We are allowed to use lethal force if they do not comply with our commands, sir. And did this man comply, private? He did not, sir. Then why did you not sound the alarm? Why was this man still alive when I found you? You forget your orders and that can't be tolerated in this base. There is a punishment for disobedience, private. He smiled cruelly. You will both report to level 5 tomorrow at noon. My blood ran cold. Yuri stepped up to Sergei. Permission to speak, sir. Granted. The blame is mine, sir. I told Private Mikhail Sidorov to hold fire. I have overstepped my rank and disobeyed standing orders. I opened my mouth in shock. Yuri was lying. He was protecting my skin at his own risk. He shot me a quick glance and shook his head almost imperceptibly. I shut my mouth. The situation was your fault then. Sergei asked him slowly. Yes sir. Then you will report to level 5 tomorrow, alone. Now continue in your task. A cleanup team will arrive shortly to dispose of this body. With that, he walked off. I turned to Yuri once Sergei was out of earshot. Are you mad? I'm to blame too. You can't take the fall for this. You know what level 5 did to Ivan and to that researcher. You can't possibly. Keep calm, Michael. Yuri cut me off. I could tell he was trying to remain casual and managing so with great difficulty. There's no reason for two of us to go down there if we can avoid it. I'll be fine, don't worry. It can't be as bad as everyone would have you believe. He smiled wryly. Besides, this way I can tell you about what's down there when I get back. The rest of our guard shift was carried out in silence. Yuri then departed to his bunk to catch some sleep before he has to report to level 5. But I cannot sleep. I can't stop thinking about what could be waiting down there and what my friend might come back like, if he comes back at all. December 16th, 1958. Yuri has not yet returned from level 5. It's almost midnight and I still haven't seen any sign of him. December 17th, 1958. Still no sign of Yuri. I can't sleep. I stay awake for hours wondering if he's alright. December 19th, 1958. Yuri still hasn't come back. What is happening down there? December 20th, 1958. Today I couldn't take it anymore. When my guard duty ended this evening, I managed to catch Commander Yahantov while he was on his way to the officer's quarters. Permission to speak, sir. My voice was hoarse with trepidation of this conversation. He looked at me, a sort of apathetic curiosity coming over his face. He glanced down at my name tag. Granted, Private Sidorov. Sir, five days ago my friend, Private Yuri Ivanovich, was sent to level 5. He hasn't come back since then. I am worried about him. Sergei looked in my eyes, his face unreadable. And what do you wish from me, Private? I want to know whether Yuri is alive, sir. Whether he is alright, I said. My mouth was dry and my throat clenched as Sergei looked at me, a all too familiar anger building behind his eyes. You are aware that discussing our work here is not recommended, aren't you private? I had gone too far to back out now. I could only press on. Yes sir, I am. Then listen well to me, Michael Sidorov. Whether your friend is or isn't alive is of no concern to me or our task here. Our only job is to keep level 5 secure. That is what we are here to do. And I will gladly send every man in this base to their death if it means that task is carried out. Sergei's voice was getting louder and louder until he was shouting at the top of his lungs so spittle flying into my face. Completely unknowingly, I had touched on a subject which I should have never opened with him. Sir, I... I began trying to apologize. Sergei wouldn't have it. What's down there can never come to the light of day, do you understand? If your friend shot himself after what he heard there, it is a low price to pay. Never forget that. 
With that, he turned and stormed off. I might have made a huge mistake today, December 21st, 1958. If I never write again in this diary, know I have either killed myself or am too changed to ever write my memories down again. This morning, we received our orders for the day, as usual. Guard duty, maintenance, or patrol. That's all I've ever done here. Not today, though. The officer read down the list, reciting the names and duties for the first part of the day. I was always at the end of the list and only started paying attention towards the end of his monologue. Turgenev, guard duty, level 4, 0800. Kuznetsov, guard duty, level 4, 0800. Chernyshevsky, patrol, 1000. He suddenly stopped, just before my name. His eyes tightened as he squinted down on his list, as if surprised by what he read there. Then he spoke, in a strangled voice. Michael Sidorov, report to level 5. My grandfather committed suicide in 2019. I translated his diary and found out what he was hiding from us since all the way back in 1958. This is his story. If you're confused, you should probably start at the beginning. The entry from December 21st is followed by several empty pages. This is what follows. Unknown date, 1958. If you find this, please, please get off the mountain. You may not make it, but if you do, take this diary and bring it to Army Command, to the KGB, to anyone that will listen. They need to know what happened here. My heart sank when I heard the order consigning me to level 5. It took a second to truly hit me, the reality slowly settling in my mind. Sergei, it had to be him. He had remembered my inquiry into Yuri's fate and had made sure, either from cruelty or from some twisted sense of justice, that I would share my friend's fate, whatever it was. But there was nothing I could do now. I left for level 5 immediately. The officer on guard duty at the tunnel from level 4 looked at my printed orders and smiled sadly. Wait a while in the side room, son. I have to double check all level 5 postings with command. I'll just be a second. He waved vaguely to a small, unlit side room before walking over to a telephone set in the wall and dialing a number. I walked over into the side chamber resignedly. The room was dark, only lit by a thin sliver of light coming from the corridor outside and filled with dank air. There was another person waiting inside, standing silently in the corner. As I approached, I could slowly make out more features. The man seemed familiar, even in the dark. It looked like Yuri, is that you? I asked incredulously. What are you doing here? Where have you been? Meh. Michael? Yuri asked. I stared at my friend in shock. He had changed horribly in the few short days we had been parted. Where before he was a healthy, well-built man with an undying smile on his face, he was now sallow and frowning. His eyes were dead and cold. Yes, Yuri. It's me. Are you alright? Have you been discharged from level 5? You've been. I didn't get another word out. Yuri darted forward, slamming into me, one forearm pinning my neck to the wall. He thrust his face right in front of mine. Where are you going, Michael? He hissed in a sharp whisper. Have you been posted to level 5? Yes, Sergei sent me here as punishment for asking about you. Yuri swore beneath his breath. Fuck, listen to me, Michael. Don't listen to the screaming. Whatever you do, don't listen to it. If you can't take it anymore, do whatever you have to, just get out of there. Fake an illness, insult the officer and get taken to the prison wing. Whatever you need, just get out of there. There was a cough from the door. The officer stood there, uncertain as to what was happening. You have been cleared for level 5, Private Cedaroff. He began tentatively. Yuri backed away from me. Remember Michael, remember what I told you. Then he swept out of the room and out of sight. Everything alright, Private? The officer asked. Something the matter? No, sir. I answered finally, Yuri's cryptic warning still swirling through my head. Just talking with my friend. I walked past him, into the thick iron door separating me from level 5. It slid open slowly, revealing the room I was to guard until I was relieved. And the screaming hit me. I couldn't pay attention to anything but that sound. 
It was all-encompassing, a cacophony of agony, the sound of several men tortured beyond the limits of flesh and bone. I was no stranger to the sounds of pain after my time in the army, but none of it could compare to this. My eyes snapped to the source of the sound involuntarily. It was coming from the back of the massive room I had entered. The wall was solid rock, carved from the mountain itself. A small opening yawned dark at its base, seemingly a cave entrance that was blocked off after several meters by a pile of rubble and stone. A rockfall had sealed the cave shut. My head swam and I leaned on a wall for support. I couldn't think, couldn't focus on anything but the echoing sound of men in horrible, never-ending pain. I was drowning in a dark pool inside my mind, with nothing to grab onto. Don't listen to the screaming. Yuri's words pulled me back into reality. I steeled myself. The screaming was still there, gnawing at my sanity, but I set myself against it. I would not fall to it. A man in a lab coat made to walk past me. I stepped in his path. He was a thin man, with a bald head and the stubble of several days on his chin. Comrade, what is that? thing, I asked him, pointing to the cave entrance. Where does it lead? He looked at me in confusion. Do you not know? Didn't anyone tell you? This is my first time on level 5. I don't know anything about this place. Please, I need to know. The researcher looked around, as if checking if no one was watching us. Then he stepped in close to me. There used to be a huge cave system beneath this mountain, he said, his voice low. The local tribe would report strange noises coming out of it, and every now and then, people would disappear while on the mountain. So we sent a small unit of five to check the tunnels. What happened to them? Only one of them ever made it out. They found him three days later, wandering the wastes outside. He was beyond help, muttering to himself about the dark, blood and things underneath his skin. When another unit went to find his comrades, they got all the way down here and found the cave-in. It seems the man blew a grenade while escaping and caused a rockfall that sealed the end of the caverns off. And, and the men inside. The men inside have been screaming ever since this place was found. Not a second of silence in five years. The man stepped away from me and hurried away, obviously not wishing to continue talking. I swallowed nervously, my mouth suddenly dry and my throat tight. So glad you could join us today, Private. Came a voice from next to me. I turned and came face to face with Commander Sergei Yahantov. The man was smiling slightly, but that unceasing anger was still simmering in his eyes. Sir, yes sir, I saluted, clenching my jaw in frustration. Awaiting orders, sir, Sergei smiled. There is not much to do for soldiers here, private, except wait and remain vigilant. You will stand guard at that post until you are relieved. He pointed at a small niche set in one of the walls of the room, barely large enough for a man to stand in it. Sir, yes sir, I answered, gritting my teeth. I walked over to my post and stood to attention in it. The screaming was still hammering at my ears and tearing at my mind. There were no words to it and no halt, not even for those screaming to take a breath. There was no way it could have been so loud through the rock cutting us off from the men, if it even was men, but somehow it was drowning out everything else. I looked around the room to try and preoccupy myself with something else. It was a massive hallway, dozens of meters long and almost as many deep. There were many niches similar to mine around the walls, some occupied by dead-eyed soldiers, many others empty. The center of the room was filled with desks and elaborate equipment manned by researchers and scientists. I saw that almost all of them were wearing heavy hearing protection, drowning out the all-encompassing cacophony. They were working with complicated-looking electronic gear, the intent of which I couldn't begin to fathom. Right in front of the sealed cave entrance was a massive, wheeled cannon. In. It was loaded and ready to fire, aiming straight at the pile of rubble separating us from whatever was inside there. Manning it were five soldiers, in uniforms I didn't recognize, all with heavy ear protection. We were expendable, they were not. As my interest in the surroundings waned, the screaming returned, stronger than before. I couldn't think of anything but it. And the longer I listened, the more I became certain there was something more than human beneath it. 
an undertone no man's throat could ever utter. Whatever was in there, it wasn't altogether human. Time began to lose all meaning. How long was I standing there? Minutes? Hours? Days? I don't know. There was nothing to hold on to, nothing to compare the passage of time to, only the crying of the trapped men. I would regain consciousness, confused as to what was happening and where I was. Only the walls of my post kept me upright as I leaned heavily on them. When I closed my eyes, I could still see that terrible cave and the barrier of rock between me and whatever was in there. I don't know how long I was on guard before Yuri's words pierced the veil on my thoughts. If you can't take it anymore, do whatever you have to, just get out of there. I wish to serve my country. I would gladly have laid down my life for it. But this, this was something I could not do. I had to get out of this room before I lost my mind. Slowly, almost theatrically, I keeled over and landed face down on the floor. I shut my eyes and went limp. Medic. Someone yelled, barely audible over the screams. The thud thud of boots hammered the floor as several men ran over to me and pushed me onto my back. I kept my eyes shut, feigning unconsciousness. We need to get him to the medical wing. Came a voice I didn't recognize from somewhere above me. He may go into shock, not everyone can handle this for too long. I felt arms grab me and pull me up. I was being dragged somewhere. I hoped it was towards the exit from level 5. The movement stopped suddenly. No, the voice was Sergei Yahantov's. It came from in front, from between me and the exit. Shit. Sir, this man is unconscious. This place might have been too much for him. We need to get him to a... No, comrade. This man is here as a disciplinary measure, and here he will stay till he awakens. Take him to the prison room and put him in a cell. He will be... Safe there till he awakens. Send for a medic to check him if you wish. But sir, he... That is an order, private. Understood, sir. I was being dragged again, but in a different direction. Panic rose within me. Not only would I remain on level 5, but I would be trapped in a prison cell at the mercy of Commander Yahantov and his twisted sense of justice. But if I awoke, he might guess I was only acting. If service on level 5 was his punishment for asking about Yuri, I didn't want to find out what the price for this would be. I was laid down on a cold stone slab. An iron door slammed somewhere nearby. Then there was silence, broken only by the wailing of level 5. Time began to slip past me again. Minutes blended into hours. There was only the sound from outside. Suddenly, I was pulled back into reality. It took me a second to realize what had broken me out of my horrifying trance. Silence. Absolute silence. The screaming had stopped. There was a second of nothingness as the world drew its breath. Klaxons and sirens wailed outside the door of my cell. The thump of boots echoed through the halls as soldiers took up positions. I leapt up, running over to the solid metal door of my room, beating on it with my fists. Let me out. Let me out. Damn you all. There was no answer. Someone screamed in level 5, the same inhuman screech that had before come from within the cave. Except now, it was closer, more immediate, in the room outside. There was a gunshot, then another, and then a whole salvo. The ground shook as the massive cannon I had seen discharged a single time. The screaming grew in volume as more men joined in, but never more than a handful. One cry would die down in a wet gurgle, only for another to take its place. I backed away from the door and fell to the ground, hands clenched on my ears. Something heavy hit the door. A red puddle began spreading from beneath it. There was a crash of steel from outside, the agonized wail of heavy doors being ripped off their axis. The screaming grew distant, spreading upward through the facility, and silence fell on level 5. I have been here since then. I cannot open the cell door from inside. As far as I can tell, days have passed. Thirst and hunger torment me, but I have to hold on, in case I am ever rescued. I have to warn, someone, I have to warn them about what happened on level 5. December 29th, 1958. I was trapped in my cell for 5 days. Hunger and cold took their toll on me. I would have died of dehydration, but there was a small, filthy toilet in the corner of my room. 
After a day, my thirst overcame my revulsion, and I drank from it greedily. The water only lasted two days, and thirst quickly added itself to my list of tormentors. The lights went out after several hours, as whatever happened to the base above destroyed the generators, plunging me into darkness. I was almost relieved, unable to see the dried red stain around the door. I was starving and freezing, but my real enemy was my own mind. I could still hear the carnage outside, echoing in my mind. The inhuman screaming, the desperate gunfire, the sounds of a whole military base, unable to stop whatever had come out of that cave. When I heard the sound in the corridor outside, I thought that I had to be hallucinating. I hadn't heard anything but my own voice for days. I rolled over on the floor and ignored it. But then it came again, footsteps, slow, wary, echoing down the abandoned hall. They were getting closer, heading right for my cell. I leapt to my feet, swaying as my head swam. There was nothing in my cell I could use as a weapon. I bared my fists, turning in the dark to where I thought the door was. Something grabbed hold of the heavy iron bar locking it, and it scraped loudly as it was drawn up. The door crashed open, a blinding light shone into my eyes. I cringed backwards, my illusions of putting up a fight gone in a rush of terror. I shrank backwards, raising my arms to protect my eyes. Michael, Michael, stay calm, it's me. It was Yuri's voice. The light swung downwards and I squinted at its source. Yuri stood in the cell door, one hand gripping a battery-powered light, the other holding a pistol. Yuri, what? What are you doing here? I thought. Everyone was dead. I slurred. Not everyone. I'm sorry it took me so long, Michael. I didn't know you were in the cell. I thought you died like almost everyone else. Sergei the Bastard only told us yesterday that you were locked up when it happened. Wa Water. I mumbled, the edges of my vision darkening. I fell to one knee. Yuri rushed over, pulling a canteen from his belt. Here, drink. There's more up above. I grabbed the canteen and tore it open, wolfing down the water inside. I wanted to thank Yuri to ask him a thousand questions, but my body didn't allow it. Darkness folded in around me and I felt myself falling. That was two days ago. When I awoke, I found myself in a mess hall on level 1. The survivors of whatever happened on level 5. Some 50 soldiers in total have holed up here. We have fires, food and water. When I recovered, I immediately asked Yuri about what had happened to the base. We don't even know, he answered, a flash of fear crossing his face. One moment, everything was normal. The next, people were screaming, Michael. Then they dropped, blood at the mouth, and someone else would start. We tried killing whoever it took, but it would always jump to someone else. What? How is that possible? I don't know, Michael. It shouldn't be, and yet, out of the 500 men on this base, there's only 50 alive now, and we only survived because we hid. Whatever took those men, it seems that if it can't see you, you're safe. Or at least safer. What happened when? When everyone in sight was dead. Yuri sighed. The last four men to be taken by it. Them. They never stopped screaming. They ran into the wastes outside. We haven't seen them since. We sat in silence for a while. What happened to Sergei? I asked finally. Yuri smiled, a flash of his old attitude warming his face for a second. He has been... Relieved of command, you could say. When it was all over he appeared, unharmed, and tried to make us follow the screaming men out into the dark. We wouldn't have it. He shot old Lebedev before we could restrain him. Where is he now? In the other mess hall on this level. He hasn't answered any questions about what the hell happened and stays silent most of the time. Come along, I'll take you to him. We picked our way through the men lying and sitting around our makeshift shelter. Everyone was quiet, the loudest voice a whisper, even though these men had survived the horrors from level 5. Something had died within them. Sergei lay in the corner of the second mess hall, his hands and legs bound. When we approached, he smiled mirthlessly. Private Cedarov, it seems Yuri's hope of rescuing you was not as foolish as I thought. You're lucky to be alive. As are you, Commander. I retorted, barely keeping my anger at bay. Care to tell us what the hell is happening? Those are state secrets, Private. I can't tell you anything. Yuri snorted. You've already failed the Union, Sergei. Whatever we were here to guard, it's escaped. 
Best you tell us what it was, and maybe we can salvage something from the situation. The former commander looked at Yuri dolefully. I did what was in my power to guarantee the safety of this facility. There was nothing more I could have done. Yuri swore savagely and spat at the ground at Sergei's feet before turning around and stalking off. I followed after him. What's our next move, Yuri? I asked once I caught up to him. We have to do something. We have to get to Army Command to warn them. This whole area area needs to get locked down as soon as possible. Come outside with me, Michael. I followed my friend, confused as to what he intended by this. As we walked through the abandoned base and out into the freezing night, I realized what he wished for me to witness. From somewhere out in the dark, the faint sound of men screaming carried to my ears. They're still out there, Michael, somewhere. We've sent out patrols, trying to find them. They either return with no information, or they don't return at all. So, what does that mean for us? We don't know where they are. We don't have the gear to take the trek to reach civilization. For all purposes, we're trapped here. January 2nd, 1959. We have remained camped in the remainder of level 1. Sergei still hasn't talked. Three men didn't return from patrol today. January 7th, 1959. Five more men have gone missing on patrol since my last entry. Food and water are still in supply, but we're running out of cigarettes. January 12th, 1959. Seven more men are dead. Sergei remained silent. There has been talk among the survivors of executing him. January 19th, 1959. There is little reason for me to continue this diary other than keeping track of our losses. Twelve more men have been lost to the Screaming Ones. Sergei hasn't spoken in three days. No more cigarettes. January 25th, 1959. Today the Screaming came closer to our base than ever before, all the way to the ruined entry gate. We lay low, gripping rifles in terror, mumbling prayers and curses. Thank God, it passed after half an hour, moving somewhere down the mountain. Four men went to follow it, swearing to kill the screaming men from a range. They haven't returned. January 28th, 1959. Today Sergei finally talked. We haven't fed him in days and only gave him small amounts of water. Finally, he cracked and agreed to talk to us. He never pleaded, never begged. He is still Sergei. Angry, prideful, utilitarian. But now, we know a bit about what we're dealing with here. We never opened the cave, not once in five years. He told us through parched lips. The best scanning equipment in all the Union was used to give us some idea what was happening on the other side of the rockfall. Our best guess was the four trapped men were just standing there for five years, standing there screaming, and no one ever tried to open the cave, a soldier growled. Would you have? We didn't know what was in there, what was in those soldiers. We still don't, even now. And how did they get outside? I demanded. The cave is still sealed. How could they escape? Your guess is as good as mine, Private Sidorov. Sergei smiled, his head lolling. Maybe they were gathering strength. Maybe they were biding their time. Maybe, given five years of doing nothing, they could pass through rock with the same ease they passed through flesh. Whatever happened to the men in this base, it only happened to those in a direct line of sight from the Screaming Ones, said Yuri. Whatever way it moved outside the cave, it doesn't seem it can do it again. That's how we all survived, after all. Sergei grinned at Yuri. By hiding like cowards, Yuri lashed out, fast as a snake. Sergei's head snapped back and blood spouted from his burst lip. Despite everything, he kept on grinning. And what do you plan to do now, Private Ivanovich? Our only chance was to follow and kill those things, and instead you turned on me. The soldiers around him started to disperse with mutters of disgust. It was clear we would get no more from our former commander. Grudgingly, I gave him a canteen of water. It seems we will all die here. Either the screaming ones find us, or we die out there in the snow. One by one, if anyone finds this diary, God be with you, for he has abandoned us. January 30th, 1959. Five more men down. We are now only 14, Yuri thankfully among them. Sergei still lives and has been moved to our mess hall to be better guarded. February 1st, 1959. May God have mercy on my soul. Today's events will haunt me till the day I die.
It was approaching nightfall when a patrol, the last two men brave enough to volunteer to search the mountain, ran into our shelter. The sentries leapt up, rifles raised, expecting trouble. There's people, people on the mountain, one of the scouts yelled. I sprang to my feet and ran over to them, Yuri close behind me, who, where, I demanded. On the slope, we counted nine, they're setting up camp as we speak. The remaining soldiers gathered around the patrol. Are they military? Yuri asked. Could they have radios? Can we contact command? No, they're civilians. Hiking expedition it seems. The patrolman answered. A dejected quiet fell on the room. Our hopes, so quickly raised, were crushed just as fast. A single voice broke the silence. Sergei's. Bait. We looked over at him, confused. What are you talking about, you son of a bitch? Asked one of the survivors. What do you mean, bait? Those people on the mountain, the things in the screaming men don't know we're here, and so they haven't come for us. But they will see those hikers, they will come for them, and that gives us an advantage. We know what they're going to do. Yuri walked over to the bound commander. What are you proposing? Even if they get to the hikers, we can't kill them without exposing ourselves. You're sitting on a military base's worth of weapons and explosives, Ivanovich. Outside, there's a mountain covered in snow. We get out there, we prime the slope with explosives, we hide and wait. When the things come for the hikers, we wait till they're screaming, and then we drop the slope on them. If the avalanche doesn't kill them, we will finish them off before they know what hit them. Yuri was quiet for a second. Suppose we did all this, he said at last. Suppose we manage to cause an avalanche, but the things survive. How do we know we'll be able to kill them? We tried and failed when they broke free. It's either this, or you stay here and die slowly, one by one, your choice. There was a second of silence, then Yuri nodded. If we are to go down, we go down fighting. Around him, the survivors were rising to their feet and muttering in agreement. A fire in their eyes that had been extinguished for a month had been rekindled. They had intent, they had hope. One more thing, added Sergei, lifting his bound hands. Free me. Yuri hesitated for a second. Then he stepped forward, drew his knife and cut Sergei's bonds. A page is left empty. Everything happened quickly after that. We gathered explosives from the armory, grenades and demolition charges, and stalked out into the night. The hikers had pitched their tent under the mountain. A dull glow came from inside, the light of a lamp illuminating it from within. The scream still came, faint on the air. Maybe the campers didn't hear them. Maybe they mistook them for the howling of the wind. Whatever it was, they stayed inside their tent. Our small group crept along the mountain above, anxious in the dark. Every movement in the black night was full of terror. It took us only a few minutes to plant the explosives on the slopes above the tent. Having prepared our trap, we stalked away, taking cover in a tree line about a kilometer away from the camp. And then we waited. For several hours we sat in the cold, freezing and terrified. Sergei held the detonator, having assumed command by force of his expertise and some residual authority. It seemed like an eternity of waiting. But then, it finally came. The moment we'd been dreading. The screams on the wind got closer and louder, approaching the tent. We saw the things coming, four specks of black on the white snow, running down the mountain towards the hikers. There was a commotion in the tent, shadows moving inside in panic. As one, the voices on the wind went silent. The running bodies fell limp into the snow, and four fresh screams arose from the camp. February 1st, 1959, continued. We froze. We'd been awaiting this moment anxiously for hours, but when it came at last, we still hesitated. Blow the slope. Do it, Sergei, yelled Yuri, breaking our horrified trance. Our commander smiled cruelly and hit the detonator. There was a loud crack and a boom, like thunder in the distance. A flash of flame illuminated the slope, casting it in sharp cut shadow and light. I covered my ears. There was a rumble that echoed across the mountain. For a second, the world held still. Then the whole slope above the tent began shifting, the vibrations setting off an unstoppable chain of motion. Tons of snow were moving, sliding down with an unsettling groaning sound. 
The mass gained speed and struck the tent with horrible force. Silence fell on the mountain. Slowly we picked ourselves up. The tension was palpable. We waited with bated breath. Did it? Did it work? I said finally, my voice hoarse. No one answered for a second, listening intently. Then Yuri whispered an answer. I think it did, he said. We should go cha. A horrifying scream, louder than any before cut through the night. My heart sank, a chill running down my spine. Yuri swore and Sergei drew his pistol. Looks like we're not done here yet soldiers, get ready. The tent bulged and then split as someone tore it open from inside. Figures streamed out, running towards our tree line. They weren't screaming, they weren't taken. But my heart sank as the last four shapes emerged from the ruined shelter. Four loud screams sounded across the mountainside once again. The thing staggered through the snow, limbs uncoordinated, as if whatever force gave the body's movement and strength was not used to these new hosts. But they were moving fast, following the fleeing hikers, and heading straight for us. Prepare to fire, Sergei commanded, his voice cold as iron. If it moves, kill it. My surviving comrades kneeled in the snow, rifles trained on the incoming figures. With a crack of gunfire, we fired our first volley. We aimed with all the skill we had, trying desperately to make sure the hikers who hadn't yet been taken wouldn't die in our crossfire. One of the screaming ones went down, and I cheered, only to curse in fear as his cry of insane pain was raised up by another of the fleeing hikers. Were these things invincible? Would death only make them leap to a fresh target? Another volley set my ears ringing, and two more bodies fell to the ground. Their screams were silenced only for a second before a pair of the fleeing hikers stumbled, twitched, and took up the agonized cry. Panic spread through our group like wildfire. Discipline collapsed. The screaming men were getting closer, our gunfire doing nothing to stop their advance. First one, then two soldiers turned and fled into the forest. Then we were all running, terror seizing our minds in a horrible grip. We ran through the midnight forest, the screams of the following things echoing around us. I cried out as the ground below me suddenly fell away and I tumbled down a small slope. A stream ran at its bottom and I fell straight into it. Ice, cold tendrils immediately spreading through my body. My comrades ran after me, some falling as I had, some keeping their footing. Sergei stood beside me and lifted me to up. What do we do? I said desperately, panic threatening to overwhelm me again. Sergei didn't have time to answer. Over the lip of the slope we had fallen down, four shapes appeared. Their screams were deafening. The next moments are only a blur in my memory. I remember desperate gunfire as the four slavering figures ran among us, their screaming mixing with our own cries of fear and confusion. The corruption spread quickly, men falling dead, others taking up their inhuman shout. One memory is clear as glass in my mind. A screaming figure, a soldier I had known as Igor Paschenko, staggered towards me, his mouth open in a disfiguring grimace. I stumbled backwards, tripping on a prone body and falling to the ground. I would have died, I should have died. But then Sergei jumped in front of me. He never panicked. He may have been cruel, a bastard and a murderer, but he never panicked. As Peschenko screamed at him, Sergei aimed his pistol and began firing. His aim was flawless. One bullet, two, three, almost a whole magazine dumped into Peschenko's chest. All but one shot. As the soldier fell to the ground, and whatever force had moved his muscles fled to find a new host, Sergei put the gun under his own jaw and fired. Then Yuri was picking me up. Run, Michael, run, back to the base. I didn't question his command, didn't ask why we would go back there. I fled, Yuri beside me, as the screaming tore through the remainder of our group. We had gotten away, but the things were soon in pursuit. As we staggered through the snow, we could hear them behind, their agonized cries slowly gaining on us. My legs burned, weakness and cold sapping my strength. I would have given up and laid down, waiting for death if Yuri hadn't kept me going. We dashed through the ruined gate of our former base, the thing some 100 meters behind. The darkness in the ruins was absolute, and we would have soon been lost if Yuri hadn't quickly found a battery-powered light. We ran downwards, through the levels of the base, the screaming now closing in behind. 
if they caught sight of us this close, it would be the end. Where? Where are we going? I panted, tears of fear and exhaustion streaming down my face. We're trapped down here. Yuri's face was set in stone. We can't kill them, Michael, he answered. If that avalanche and all the gunfire we hit them with couldn't do it, I don't know what will. Then what are we going to do? He glanced over at me for a second as we fled through the dark. Then he raised his free hand. Grasped in it were two grenades. One of these opens the caves on level 5. I lure them inside, and I hide. Once they've followed me, I'll sprint out. You have to be ready, Michael. The second I'm out of that cave, you blow the entrance. We'll cause another rock fall. We will trap them again, I realized. We will seal the cave off. Exactly. Yuri smiled grimly. He thrust one of the grenades at my chest, and I took it in shaking hands. We tore into level 5. The ground was strewn with corpses, the dead left in the wake of the screaming ones escape lying in heaps around us. Our pursuers weren't far behind. I could hear their thudding footsteps, their terrible cries. We were running out of time. Yuri sprinted towards the pile of rubble sealing off the caves. Hide, quickly, he called out. I leapt to the side of the room, taking cover behind an overturned work table. A dead body lay there, its eyes open in death, a grimace of shock and pain set on its face forever. A loud bang shook the whole level as Yuri blasted his way into the caves. The walls groaned ominously, their structure damaged, thousands of tons of rock above us pressing down with terrible pressure. The screaming ones were approaching, their cries were deafening. Yuri's light went dark as he pushed deeper into the unseen cave. There was a quiet thud as he lay it down. The bait was set. We didn't have to wait long. The cries of the things in pursuit rose in a crescendo as they crashed onto level 5. They didn't stop and dived straight into the caverns, following the light. I leapt from behind the table and ran to the cave entrance. A grenade pin clinked onto the ground as I pulled it out gripping the safety lever in sweaty hands. I waited, my heart thudding, my breath coming in short gasps. Desperation began building inside me as I realized that something must have gone horribly wrong. Yuri wasn't coming out. How long could I wait? How long did I have? Suddenly, my friend's voice cut through the cacophony of pain, echoing from the black cavern. Blow the entrance, Michael. Do it now. He yelled from the dark. I couldn't. I wouldn't. My friend was in there, and I couldn't consign him to this death sentence. Yuri, I screamed desperately. I can't. My friend limped into view, staggering around a corner of the passage. Four shapes leapt up behind him, all attention on Yuri. He hadn't been able to hide from them. We were out of time, out of options. Do it, Michael. You have to. He couldn't get any further. I saw one of the pursing bodies collapse. Yuri twitched, staggered, and fell. Tears blinded me. I released the safety lever and leapt back behind cover. There was a flash of light and a deafening boom. The screaming was drowned out. The walls shook, and the cave collapsed. Tons of rock smashed down, shattering on the ground. A cloud of dust sprang up, setting my lungs on fire. I peered through it with watering eyes. The cave was sealed. A wall of rock had fallen in its entrance, blocking it off. I fell to the ground and wept for my lost friend. This is the last entry in my grandfather's journal, except for those last words. God help us. They're still out there. No dead soldiers are mentioned in the old investigations of the Dyatlov Pass incident. I presume whatever arm of the government sent my grandfather to that unknown base had gotten there first, drawn by reports of missing hikers and made sure their involvement would never be found out. In 2019, the Russian government announced it was opening a new investigation of the Dyatlov Pass incident. The conclusion was that the accident was caused by an avalanche. I guess they're not completely wrong, or not outright lying. I think it was this reminder of his past that sent my grandfather over the edge, pushing repressed memories into his mind. I can't help but wonder if his last written words were true. Are they still in the caves? I wonder if, somewhere out there, in the icy Russian waste, buried beneath the Ural Mountains, four men, one of them a hero, and my grandfather's long-lost friend are screaming to this day. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.